Welcome back to Contractor Evolution. I'm joined by Benji here at our studio. Hey guys, for the growth-minded contractor, investing in real estate is an obvious, lucrative, and fun place to put their hard-earned profits. Making money in trades and construction and then investing said money into real estate in some shape or form seems to go together like peanut butter and jam. And compared to other asset classes or investment vehicles, this makes a lot of sense because you already have the skills, the tools, the know-how, and the contacts to elbow grease your way to wealth. Think about it like this. You can't simply throw on your tool belt and add $50,000 in value to your stock portfolio during the slow season, but a savvy contractor can do exactly that with real estate. And I think it's for this reason and a slew of others, contractors seem to really gravitate towards real estate in their wealth building journey. Now, one of the core components to success here is financing. The vast majority of real estate transactions involve a lender in some capacity. However, as you may have noticed, uh, getting continuous financing isn't always easy, especially as an entrepreneur. Banks and other lenders, uh, they see a lot more risk in us than they do in, say, doctors, lawyers, or dentists. To have a long and successful career as a real estate investor, you need to be, let's call it, be lendable. And this in itself is a skill worth learning. And this is why today we're excited to have Kyle Green on the show with us. Kyle is the founder of the Green Mortgage Team. He has been in this investment lending business for real estate for about 17 years now, and he runs a team of nine at his firm. Throughout his career, he's funded over a billion dollars in mortgages, predominantly to business owners just like you. So he knows the ins and outs of the unique lending needs and situations of entrepreneurs. He's also written a book, Rockstar Real Estate Investing, which I just recently read over a coffee in Vienna, and uh, we're linking it here in the show notes below. Great conversation with Kyle. A couple of the highlights from today. We talk about how entrepreneurs can find that fine balance between being tax efficient with what you pull out of your business, but still remaining lendable in the eyes of a bank. We talk about the most common ways contractors majorly screw up with real estate and how to avoid that. And lastly, we talk about how the rising interest rates are changing the investment landscape and what you can do about it. So let's dive in with Kyle Green. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Kyle, welcome to the studio. Happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for coming in today, uh, Kyle. I'm really looking forward to this. So I thought a good place to start is with this question. When we were you know, super blessed to work with like 500 plus contractors from all over North America, we've had hundreds more come through the program and are sort of alumni now. We do have a pretty broad perspective on this. And one of the things we've noticed is that when it comes to wealth building, legacy, uh, setting themselves up well for the future – blue collar business owners, no matter what industry they're in, seem to really gravitate towards real estate. Like this is sort of a, it's always like a bolt on. They've got rental suites, they've got short term rentals, they've got, they've got house, they've got flips, they've got all sorts of stuff that they're doing. And it's sort of this, this business behind their business. Uh, we're going to talk about this pretty holistically and we'll go through the pros that we'll go through the cons, we'll go through the risks, but just at the outset here, why do you think that real estate is such a complementary asset class for the types of listeners that we have? Yeah. Well, first, let's maybe talk about why real estate is awesome. Um, and the way that you make money in real estate is really through three different ways. And there's actually a fourth that is really relevant to your audience. But let's talk about the first major three. Um, you make money from real estate by getting cash flow, make money from the appreciation, and you make money from the mortgage pay down. The cash flow is something that people always talk about and think about. I want to buy something that cash flows. Certain markets, it's really difficult to buy in, like in Vancouver, mm -hmm. really hard to put 20% down payment and actually have something that cash flows positively. Right. The appreciation, of course, is the sexy one. And the reason for that is because of leverage. So as an example, if I put 20% down payment on a $500,000 property, that means I have, I've put $100,000 into it. Mm. Now, my, if the property go, value goes up from 500000 to five twenty five. That's that's only a five percent increase in the in the price, but my return on in investment is actually fifty percent. Yeah, 
right? As opposed to with stocks, for instance, typically at least the way you should be doing it. If you're going to own a thousand dollars of an asset, you need to put in a thousand dollars of cash. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So this is one of those assets where you can you can get that lift and that growth, but have only have put in way fewer dollars of equity. Exactly. And yeah. and just to clarify, um, when I use that number, by the way, the math guy, uh, five percent going uh, of value going up. That's actually uh, a twenty five percent return, not fifty percent mm-hmm. return. Yeah, it's because the value of the property goes up by uh, by twenty five thousand dollars on a five hundred thousand dollar property. The way the math works out really is if you put one fifth of the property value down for down payment, then every one percent of appreciation is five percent return your capital. Right, right. So that's the one that people uh, get excited about real estate in because it's hard to get that kind of leverage. And technically, you can in stocks to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, but it's very very difficult to do that. And then the one that doesn't get a lot of accolades but is nice and steady is the mortgage paydown. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, and so if if you bought something for $500,000 and you had a $400,000 mortgage because you put $100,000 down, your tenant may be paying down the mortgage by six grand a year. It's not a lot, but again, that $6,000 pay down on a $100,000 investment is a 6% return on capital. Yeah. Um, so it's not sexy, but it's almost like your dividend that just pays every single year yeah. um, from that perspective. It's right? forced savings, but the tenant is doing the savings for you. Correct. Yeah. 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 So even if you bought a property that didn't generate any positive cash flow, if you expect some appreciation, usually like 3% annual appreciation in a lot of markets yeah. uh, in North America anyways, um, that would represent a 15% return in investment from the appreciation part. And then um, looking at the mortgage pay down, you're probably getting you know 6% from there. So all of a sudden, 21% return on, on investment per year on average is pretty good. Yeah. You know? And so that's those are the three ways that you really make money in real estate. But there's a fourth... And the fourth is forcing the appreciation, Mm. right? And this is where, for your audience listening today, this is where you can probably add the most value. Because if you can do the right work to a home, you can improve the value by more than the amount of money that you put into it. So, you know, and and there's lots of of discussions and an appraiser would typically tell you that putting a pool into a property, especially in Vancouver, (laughs) we don't get a lot of sunshine here in Vancouver, right? But putting a pool into a property doesn't always generate a positive return on your, on your cash. It might cost you $20,000 to put in the pool. The value of the home might not actually not in, inc- increase or appreciate. So that's something to consider. But usually redoing a, a kitchen, redoing bathrooms, uh, flooring, painting, et cetera, those are the things that generally generate a positive return. Those ones specifically in, yeah, versus others. General. Yes, yeah. in general. Yeah. Where you, you might put $50,000 into a combination of those, but you might appreciate the property by 80000 by doing that. Correct. Right. And even more than that, if your labor cost is much cheaper because you're in the business yeah. or you're doing it yourself because you know how to do it or you're just running your, your crew yeah. at cost, maybe you're filling in a gap here where, hey, we've got projects, but we've got a bit of a gap in, in, um, in projects and yeah, I've yeah. got to keep my staff busy. Hey, I'll do a quick flip or or an improvement yeah. on a home, you know? And and so I was reading your book a couple months ago over a really nice espresso in Vienna. <laughs> Rockstar <laughs> Real Estate Investing. We'll, Rockstar we'll Real Estate Investing. Somewhere. We'll put it up uh, somewhere here on the screen. So I was reading Rockstar Real Estate Investing while watching Viennese people walking by in the morning. And uh, and one of the things, the chapters I remember from that book, you called it the, the $1 condo. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about like, because this is very much in context to that. So tell us a bit about like how that structure yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. In, in theory, if you buy a property and you improve the value enough with, an, with let's say you put 30 grand in and it improves the value by $80,000, it may get to, to a point where you can put in this money and you can actually refinance and pull enough money back out of the condo to put all of them down payment plus the renovation budget right back in your jeans. Yeah. And yeah. so it, it's possible. Um, you know, it usually needs a little bit of help on, you know, the market appreciating at the same time too. Yeah. Um, unless you do a really, really good job of, of the renovations blowing out of the water, you know? Yeah. yeah. So the, um, the the there's a number of Breakthrough Academy members that I know that do this super, super well. So the analogy would be like, you might buy like a small building or a duplex or a triplex or something for a million dollars, you go in on, with 200,000 and you do a series of renos that that lifts that value to 1.2, 1.3 million when those are done and you refinance it at that point and then you can bring a bunch of that initial down payment back out. Yep, you got it. To you. Yeah, and, and I, I want to make a comment here. Like, like this is very, this is like very well 
uh, there's a lot of content about the, I think, you know, the bigger pockets guys call it the Burr method. Exactly. Yep. Buy, uh, rent, renovate, uh, rent, refinance. And that's, you know, that's, that's sort of the method for a lot of wealth building for a lot of people. So I'm not saying that this is, you know, we're going to uh, break down the tactical stuff, uh, to a level that hasn't already been done out there in the, in the thoughtosphere. But what I do think is interesting is this, is this complementary nature for our listenership in particular, because I like the way you phrase it. It's, it's the forced appreciation. If you have a roster of sub trades that you know really well, you have hands-on skills yourself and so does your team. You have free cash flow from the operating business that you run. You occasionally have downtime that you need to fill with. I've got my guys that are kind of twiddling their thumbs. That's a very interesting recipe that makes this, I think, especially appealing. And I, I suspect that's why you, you see this so consistently with, with builders, landscapers, painters, renovators, what have you. This is why they probably gravitate towards real estate in particular. Yep, 100%. Yeah, it's just something so, they understand, right? Yeah, yeah. So Kyle, let me ask you this. You, um, you've got quite a number of years under your belt working heavily with real estate investors. Um, that's like, that's a really big part of your body of, of your work. Um, and you've seen, I'm sure a lot of them as, as they kind of get older and later into their careers and have had a lot of success, paint this picture for us a little bit. If somebody is really diligent with this, makes smart decisions, is really focused, stays true to, to fundamental principles of success. What is that, what is their setup in their, in their life and their investment holdings? What does it look like 25, 35 years into this journey? Yeah, I mean, there's there's people across the spectrum and a lot of my, my clients, I, I can think of a few of them in particular that have 10 rental properties. They're half paid down or three quarters paid down. So right. they're almost paid off. Because of tax reasons, it's, you're not incentivized to completely pay them off in many yeah. cases, but that's, again, probably another podcast. <laughs> um, you have 10 properties that are covering themselves, putting some money in your jeans. Your house is paid off. You've got a big fat line of credit on it now, which you can use to fund anything. Sometimes if you, even if you're doing a flip, you can say, okay, I'm going to use my line of credit to fund this project mm -hmm. and pay it off once I've once I've completed it on my because flip. Because your own house is kind of like a bank. Like you've got, that's you've, right. you've got ability to lend on it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's important. Um, and I think to a certain point, the, the assets in the portfolio have replaced the income that you need to live off of. And it doesn't mean that those people stop working, but instead of you having to take a job because you need the money... You start to say, what jobs do I want to do? Which ones will make me money long term? Mm -hmm. And you get that point where you're always focusing on the long term and the long term just keeps snowballing into itself almost. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to take the short term job because you really need the money today. You just keep doing these long term things that, hey, I won't see the cash flow for this for five years. But when I do, I'm going to see more of it. And I don't care that I don't in the short term because I'm good. Exactly. I'm covered from, from, from my rental income. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very, very interesting. Um, it's it's definitely a neat place to be in, and and I, so I've seen that in people. There's something about your decision making in business that that really helps you see the broader perspective, where you're not at all focused on the short term, and you see like the macro trends. I think a lot more clearly because you're not hustling in that day to day. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, super interesting. So, so tell me this then. Um, you, you've seen a lot of success in in the people around you in your career. Um, for business owners specifically, being able to access financing is a really core principle of successful real estate investing because that's typically the roadblock that people will hit eventually is like you just can't get financing. And we know that as business owners, our income, maybe banks and lenders might not see us as, as, as a safe bet as would like a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer. Um, so when you look at entrepreneurs you work with that have had sustained success over decades, what are some of the fundamental components that they hold center? Like what are the principles that they abide by to have long-term success, especially in the ability to get finance long-term? Yeah. Consistency of income is important. So, um, it's pretty, pretty broad across the spectrum as far as how lenders treat income. But even if you're an employee, um, it is either what you averaged the last two years or what your minimum guaranteed income is. Mm -hmm. And guess what? When you're self-employed, you don't have a minimum guaranteed income. And so they're always going to look at your past history. Now, if your past history bounces around like this and you had a bad year last year or you pulled less money out of your company last year, now you have a really low number. Now, in order to, to be able to qualify for a mortgage in the next upcoming year, your income for the following year is going to have to be way higher to pull up the average mm -hmm. of that under average uh, year, right? Yeah. And so that inconsistency really messes with you. Now, 
there are some special programs that do exist. And, you know, in Canada, for instance, there are programs where if you're incorporated, some of the lenders will take some of your incorporated income that re was retained inside of the company. So let's say that the company made $300,000, but you only took $100,000 home and paid personal income tax on that. Some lenders would use a portion of the $200,000 mm. that stayed in the company. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is from a tax planning perspective, you didn't pay the personal income tax to right. take it home, right? But you still get to use some of it. Usually it's not 100% of the income, but yeah. you get to use a certain amount of it. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't matter whether it's retained in the operating company or the holding company? No, as long as you can follow the money and it yeah. sits somewhere and they can show a two-year history of the money landing somewhere and yeah. that corporate net income being uh, being a number that cool. you can use. Yeah, yeah but th th that definitely makes sense. Like lenders are looking for the predictability of your income. Where are they going to find that? They're going to find that retrospectively. What was it like? So th that makes sense. So that that's the first principle. So principles of success, um, I, I definitely get that one. What, what are others? What are some of the core kind of things that people really stick to that have success long-term? Watching your, your credit is really important too. Um, one of the issues that people get into when you're self-employed is you borrow a lot of money mm -hmm. to make investment choices and uh, to buy equipment and to run your day-to-day -day business. And I think that's one of the issues as well that you're going to see is when you do borrow money on your personal credit, it's going to negatively impact your ability to get personal credit. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that's really important and one of the reasons it's really good to look at incorporating is it creates a little bit, a bit of a divide. You say this stuff over here is personal and this stuff over here is corporate. Mm -hmm. right? And you try to keep that line separated because typically corporate debt does not report in your personal credit bureau and lower your ability to be able to qualify in mm -hmm. the future. So that's something that's really important to do is just try to keep that divide and keep that separation. Yeah. So if you've got finance equipment that's sitting in like registered to your construction company with leases and financing on that stuff on the company, it generally won't affect you personally. Generally. And, and vehicles is one of the ones that often they do want a personal guarantee and it often yeah. shows up. But again, in Canada, a lot of the time you can show six months of statements showing the money actually the, for the uh, payments leaving a corporate account. And then right. a lot of the time they'll say, okay, I can see in the financials and I can see the money leaving right. the corporate account. Let's remove those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and another really important thing is just planning. Uh, we talked about the fact that they're looking in the rear view mirror to determine what your, uh, what your usable income is. Well, guess what? If you've already filed your taxes and you wanted to buy a property this year, it's too late to change your tax planning. Yeah. You've yeah. already filed, right? And so... I think it's important to figure out what do you want to achieve in the following year and then what needs to happen? Cause you can, your accountant wants to do their job, which is to lower your taxable income. Your mortgage broker or bank is going to say, well, I need a higher income to do my job, which is to get you the best mortgage. And so there's a bit of a tug of war. Yeah, and so right. a lot of the time you just need to get everybody sitting down at the table and say, okay, this is what I want to do next year. Everything. I right. want to be able to buy a property. I want to grow my business. I want to do this. And then you can figure out what's the minimum amount of income I need to maximize my objectives with buying a home, yeah. buying a rental mm -hmm. property, et cetera. It's, it's a bit of a dance too, right? Because um, on the one hand, business owners are going to be incentivized to keep their on paper earnings as low as possible. I mean, we see this all the time, like, oh, I made too much money this year. Let's go, <laughs> let's go buy some stuff, uh, you know, get a new Ford F-350, whatever. On the other hand, you do need that on paper income to be lendable. And so I think there's a very, it's, it's a, balanced approach to both where it's, hey, you know what, I'm maybe not going to strip out all the money I can for my business because I'm going to get absolutely hammered by the tax man one year. But I'm also not going to do this like, you know, totally artificial, like, oh, I only made like $43,000 last year, Mr. Government. It's some, it's finding somewhere in between into your comment about planning. It's like, if you know, if you can forecast your two-year picture, five-year picture, and you can kind of see somewhere out in the medium term distance, there's Hey, we're gonna pick up a building here. I'm gonna buy a rental property, whatever. There, there'd be that. That would be very instructive to the way that you actually strategically sort of do that tax planning and file everything. Correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Th that, that's that's one big thing I'm hearing from Kyle right now. The the importance of having a plan and 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 creating some sort of like vision and roadmap so yeah. that you can make the right plays tax structure wise when you're buying certain important things that, that, that you want to buy that might negatively affect your ability to get lending, the way that you can get your advisors to work together. Speaking of advisors, tell me a bit about experts like this stuff. I mean, th there, there's a million and one people that say that they really get this, but it, in my experience, not a ton of, 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 especially mortgage professionals really understand business owners. Like what is, what does that world look like? Are there certain brokers that are a lot more focused on working with entrepreneurs and investment focus? What does that landscape look like? 
Yeah, there definitely are brokers that are better at doing this than, than others. Um, you know, in my brokerage, we I'm often the guy that's looked to to help on those types of complicated deals because you're sometimes you're following different companies and the money's following through different different corps and sometimes they have different year ends. It gets quite messy sometimes. Yeah. So different brokers have a different skill set. The the challenge for a consumer is these people typically know more about financing than the consumer does or the borrower. And so every one of these people that they talk to seems like they know more than they do, right? right. And so the question often is just ask them a pointed question. If you're wanting to buy rental properties, then ask them how many they own. How many mm -hmm. rental properties do you own, you know? And what's your strategy? What's your what's your objective next year? What, do you, what are your goals? If the broker doesn't have any objectives, any goals, a, a game plan of their own, and doesn't already own rental properties, then you know, they, they better be really, really good at some other things for you to consider using totally. them, right? Same thing for business owners. I do find in general, brokers that also do commercial lending, they're more used to reviewing corporate financials and understanding them and parsing through these to understand, and not only to just get you financing, but also to give you some advice that you might not be able to get by using somebody that doesn't know how to read these. Yeah. You know, totally. sometimes I look at these and I say, hey, just just food for thought, maybe you talk to your accountant about doing this. Mm, yeah. So really quick example of that, this these corporate net income programs I was talking about earlier, you can only use it um, with most lenders if you own the company 100%. Now, sometimes, especially I find a lot of uh, contractors, they co-own these yep. businesses together. A lot of partnerships. Very common, right? So sometimes we look at the corporate financials and say, well, there's a lot of corporate net income here, but we can't use it because if you want it out, your partner might say, well, I don't want to take it out. So we can't dividend out of the company. However, a, a common structure then is to actually set it up so that each of you have a holding company that hovers above it and owns your shares in the operating company. Oh, interesting. And okay. then that company can dividend up to your respective holding companies. And then you can choose to take the money out of that company if you choose to or not. Huh. But it's a way of then saying, well, now I do own 100% of my holding company, of my 50%, and now I get to use the corporate net income. That's a workaround for the partnership thing that people kind of fall, yeah. find themselves in. Exactly. And yeah. it actually comes up a lot, I find, especially with this um, this class of individuals. Yeah. I want my money out. The other partner, oh, he's, he's, he's 20 years older than I am, and he doesn't need the money because he's already got his house. He's got everything. So you set up corps above it, and then you can re you can dividend out to your respective corps, and then each of you get to choose what you do with the money. Yeah. All this to say, like I think one important realization, if you as a listener haven't haven't kind of connected it already, is that that your situation as an entrepreneur is inherently a lot more complex and a lot more difficult when it comes to this subject than is. Um, you know, a couple looking for a family home that is like the city fireman, a city fireman and a, and a teacher. Like it's, it's very clear. Like you have your, your paid income black and white, like pretty much most mortgage brokers can, can, can make that happen. But your situation is for better and worse, a lot more complex. So having uh, good advisors and good experts is super important. So this is, anyways, this is really good. Benji, I know you have a question you're wanting to get to here. I just want to wrap up. So fundamental components of success, people that do this really well, long-term, some things you mentioned, they really understand the importance of consistency and cash flow and they can manage their business, their budgets, their cash flow projections, and then and then run their business in such a way that brings consistency. That totally makes a lot of sense why, why lenders would want that. You talked about like the right kind of tax structuring and being able to create a plan well in advance a couple of years, like a bit of a roadmap for your real estate investment so you can structure your taxes that way and figure out how much money should be taken out personally into the hold co. Um, number three, you talked about the importance of understanding leverage yep. and, and, and where you might be taking taking on too much leverage where you're not enough, you know, when would be not the right time to buy three of those F-250 Platinums that you may or may not need. And uh, and then the importance of having some good experts around you. So those, yep. are, those are some great points. So I, I, I think this is, uh, you know, you're uniquely positioned to answer this better than a lot of people. Are there any, um, like I just, that the point about, hey, two, co two hold co's, the, are there other like lending mechanisms, tools, I'm reluctant to use the word loopholes, but like tips and tricks here that are not immediately obvious um, that most business that are people don't take advantage of enough? What are like underused things available to a smart entrepreneur that you wish more of them would tap into? Yeah, good, good question. So I would say one thing that's really important is just understanding that the standard method of qualifying for a mortgage isn't the only method of qualifying for a mortgage. And mm -hmm. if you're talking to the wrong person or the wrong bank that doesn't have the specific program, they might say, oh, you don't have enough income, you need to claim more income. 
And I think that's where, well, there are other options and other routes available. Like what? Um, so B lending, for in instance, okay? So I was talking to a dentist a little while ago who would have had to claim so much more in his next year's income in order to qualify for the mortgage. We talked to the accountant and we said, well, I think you're better off paying an extra 1% on the mortgage and a 1% fee because this cost is, let's call it $30,000 but your tax liability to increase your income enough to qualify for this mortgage was going to be $70,000. So why don't we just, you know, balance you out instead of having this massive increase in, in taxable income, let's just get you to a point where you need to be. So in a year from now, we can requalify you. And I think that the, the problem is that banks often don't have a B lending division. Mm. So they're not going to tell you that that option is available. They're going to say, well, the, the, here's what you need to do. And yeah. that's often a very concerning issue is that they say, well, here is your option here. And, and people assume that that's the only it's option, your option in it's the here's market. Here's what you have to do. Yeah, from exactly. Their perspective. Yeah. From the bank's perspective, that is the only option, but not from the consumer's perspective that they talk to other people. Mm. Yeah. So um, in that yeah. example, you're saying it would effectively be a lot cheaper for you to take a high interest B lender for a year or two years or whatever, and then switch back to a regular mortgage than it would be to claim such a high income Correct. and pay all of that personal tax. That makes a ton of yeah. sense. And we just reverse engineer, hey, instead of paying yourself $360,000 in the next tax year, we need your average to be 220,000. So just bump it up slightly to 220 this year and next year also do 220 and then we'll get you out of the B and move you into an A lender. Okay. A hundred percent. Yeah. Because to take at any more than that, you're almost paying like $2 to get a dollar. Yeah. Right. Exactly. What, anything else besides this B lending option? Um, yeah, I would say a HELOC, a home equity line of credit is a really useful tool and it's a way that you can better help with the cash flow of your business. Um, and one of the, the things that's really important here is that whenever you borrow money to invest, the interest portion of the payments is tax deductible in, in Canada. That's the way it is. I think in the U S it's actually even on your residence. You can, yeah. you can write that off, which is interesting. And one of the things in the tools then is to set it up so that you take that and you try to pay down your mortgage, your non-tax deductible mortgage as quickly as possible, and then rebar the money back out to then invest. Mm. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, we could again have another podcast, I think just on this one topic, but the, the key is to understand the power of a home equity line of credit. Access to capital when you're self-employed is so key because you, you never know, you might have a really great year, you take out the money, you spend it, you do whatever with it, maybe you pay down the mortgage, great, in a, in a vacuum, but what if the next year is not so good and now you wish you had access to the capital? Mm -hmm. A HELOC, if it's what's called readvanceable, means that it's connected. So as you pay down the mortgage, the line of credit limit automatically increases by this corresponding amount. So then you pay it down, you're not paying interest on that money. And then the future, oh my gosh, you really need access to capital? Well, I literally have it available in my line of credit. I'll pull yeah. it out and kick it back to the company or do whatever I need with it. It does that automatically? With certain lenders, it does. Interesting. Yep. It like updates monthly or quarterly or every, something. Every payment. Yeah. Huh. The line of credit limit ticks up over and over and over again. So really interesting. it's great. It's almost like you have a, a well with a butt rope and bucket attached to it so you can pull the pull it back out. Yeah. 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 Su super interesting stuff. Um, let's talk a bit about downsides. Okay. So this is, uh, I think that, you know, there's often an inherent fear around taking on a lot of debt. And that's, you know, that's partly why the strategy works so well is because you have leverage. So my broad question is how, when you look at, at in real estate investors, entrepreneurs specifically that are, that are on their investment journey, uh, I'm sure you've seen some that have made some pretty major mistakes and, and you're always focused on growth, but then you can have these major setbacks that, that take you back like 20 steps in one mistake. How do people really screw this up? What are the big things that you've seen really go wrong that everyone listening should be aware of? Benji's really excited to hear this. I can tell. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day that the key is when you're running a business, when you're when you're getting into investing in real estate, which is also a business, it's all about cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's really important to make sure that you're 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 purchasing investment properties that are producing cash flow. And if you're going to do an investment that isn't going to generate cash flow, then you may you have to really make sure that you have got a lot of liquidity on the other side of the equation, right? Ver so you're saying you're, you're saying orient yourself towards something that cash flows versus something that's more of like an like an equity or or a uh, 
a growth plan. I'm going to buy something. I'm going to spend six months renovating it and hopefully I'm going to it's speculate going to be more, that it'll go spe- up. Speculative yeah. is the right word. You're saying do something that's sort of cash flow oriented versus speculation oriented. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And an example of this would be, you know, some contractors will eventually say, hey, I'm building homes for other people and they're making all the money. So I'm going to build a home for myself and make money. And then they realize, wait a second, it's the developer that's making all the money, not, not the builder. Um, I want to be the developer and I'm going to buy land and rezone it and go through that process. As you move into those layers, every one of those steps requires more and more capital and more and more patience. And I think that that's the issue that people sometimes get into is they don't have the patience that where I see people get really, really crushed is when they buy land, hoping to get it rezoned. They don't realize what the process is. Mm -hmm. And then they realize that they get, uh, they get totally crushed on that Mm -hmm. because they keep sitting there. They have a lot of debt that's not generating any income that's coming back. Yeah. Um, And you can, you can zoom out and look at, Hey, even just a, a condo flip, you buy that in the wrong market. You don't think about your plan B. What happens if I have to turn this into a long-term rental? What if the market turns on me and I can't sell it for profit and have to put a long-term tenant in there? What's my negative cash flow going to look like? Mm-hmm. And it's one thing for your rental property to be cash flow negative, but what if your business and your rental property are both cash flow negative at the same time? And that does happen. Mm-hmm. So on these big mistakes, that's a really good one. What you're essentially saying is like you've not th- thought through all of the scenarios that are underneath your A scenario yeah. of like, here's how it should go, but you've not thought through what if this goes wrong? What's the plan B? What if two things go wrong? What's the plan C? Yep, exactly. Yeah. You need to have that plan um, and you need to look at what happens if the plan doesn't work out. If plan A doesn't work out, you need to make sure you have that fallback. And mm-hmm. I think that that's really important then to make sure that you have a lot of liquidity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't just pile drive all of your liquid cash into real estate and expect everything to go great because yeah. although the return Returns on investment are very enticing. It's something that people know and understand and trust. Um, real estate is a business and investing in it requires capital and mm-hmm. it requires liquidity. And you also have your own business, which also requires liquidity. Totally. And remember too, that, that most people that are contractors, they're double dipping a little bit where if the real estate market is really good, they're making a lot of money and they're making money on the real estate. But if both, if the real estate market takes a dive, they're getting hit on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're saying that, and I agree with you, their, their business and the real estate market are, are quite attached. Yes. Homeowners are doing well, their values are going up, they're feeling good, they're spending more on pools and landscapes and paint jobs and what have you. Same thing is, is, is true in reverse. So, um, it's, you know, buying real estate while a great investment vehicle, it's not, it's actually not diversification as much as they might think it is because they're so complementary to each other yep. and they move on the same pattern. And it's not really liquid. And, and if you, if you had a really good year and the real estate market is really good and then you say, okay, I've got a bunch of cash, let's do something with it. And you buy a rental, a rental property. And then the next year it's not doing, uh, your business isn't doing as well. Are you really incentivized to sell that property if the real estate market is going down and now you want to sell it at a loss? Like, oh, that's not really a good time. So I think that having enough liquidity to be able to hold on to real estate for the long term, because we talk about, oh, 3% annual appreciation. Guess what? That comes in spurts. It doesn't come every single year like clockwork. It's often zero, zero, minus one, minus two, you know, plus four. 30%, (laughs) Thirty <laughs> percent, yeah, you know, but totally. you got to hang on to it for long enough to see that plus thirty percent for it to actually be worth your while to get into it. Yeah. Can so you talk a little bit more, like specifically, and we don't need to name names, but like, like just in broad strokes, what are some of the examples of young entrepreneurs who are, uh, you know, have a big appetite for risk and are maybe a little bit naive about the implications, who don't maybe respect the needs of liquidity and they just pull as much out as they can buy, 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 like talk about maybe like you can twist the knife a little here. Like what, what happens to people when the market shifts, when their business kind of suffers, what are some of the scenarios you, you see people sadly find themselves in? Divorce <laughs> straight up though. Yeah. I mean, that, that is an issue. Um, Cause all of a sudden the, the spouse is looking at you like, wait a second, we don't have enough money to pay for our food. Why do we make this investment? Now we're going to sell this at a loss and then, you know, egos are hurt and, right. um, and things can, can happen. And frankly, we see a lot of, we see a lot of that, um, in market circumstances that, uh, that are like that. So when real estate values are going down, we see divorces happening a lot more. Um, wow. You know, people sometimes here, here's another thing. So imagine that you, you bought a rental property and it was, you thought it was going to be good. And now all of a sudden the real estate market is turning, turning, and now it's worse. 
and now you're not making as much money in your business. And now what, what kind of decisions can you make? So earlier, Igor, you're saying, Hey, it's, you know, the, the perfect dream of, of somebody that's established and they're making that, that, um, they're making business decisions based on the future and better, um, better outcomes in the future. Well, what happens all of a sudden is, okay, now I need to make decisions that make money today. Mm -hmm. I need to put money in my jeans today. And it might go counter to your values and your culture. You might be putting your team members into situations where, hey, guys, we got to grind it out and do this weak job because I need the money or we need the money. And now all of a sudden you're losing employees. Like it can have a spinoff effect on your business because mm -hmm. you're now having to feed other things that are negative, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to look at that and you've got to put some money aside in the good times and mm -hmm. it can't just be parking it in real estate. It also has to be liquidity. Well, and I think it's important to, I think I'm glad that we're kind of like hitting this note here because I do want to have a balanced conversation about this and not have it just be an infomercial for real estate as an investment. Like there is a downside to this and- you talk to the BTA coaches, this this happens. We talk to coaches who have this happen with members every single year where it's like, yeah, they're 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 on hold right now, not in a great place. Yeah. Bought two uh, properties they were gonna flip. Markets changed in their in their, you know, in their locality. Um, their business is also struggling. <laughs> Hopefully we hear from them in six months. I mean, this yeah. is there is a dark. It is side very this. real. Yeah, it is yeah. very real. And I think that that people like people need to understand that 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 so much of the benefit around real estate is that you are applying leverage, but that is also the inherent risk. And you really need to, you need to respect that. And you cannot be too trigger happy, excited to move on certain things just because you see opportunity where you've not weighed the potential risks and what the B scenarios look like in the C scenarios and so on and so forth. So it is something to respect because it is kind of explosive in the upside and in the downside. Um, on that note, I think something worthwhile right now, like while we are on this topic, like it is, you know, it, uh, it's October, 2023 right now, uh, when we're, when we're shooting this episode, I think people are feeling this right now. Like we're like our generation, especially has all we've known is, is a world of incredibly low interest rates. It's, it, to me, to be honest, it's felt like money's been falling from the trees forever. Um, and, and that affects both like business. I mean, I'm shocked at the number of, of, fairly unviable companies that that are around and continue have continued to be around as a real head scratcher and on the real estate front is like everyone's rich for over a, a decade plus now just by buying more and more real estate and I think people are getting a bit of a reality check right now so um let's talk a bit about like the current vibes right now like what 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 are you seeing out there and what kind of lessons are people learning based on on today that rates don't always stay really, really low. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's the big one. Um, I think the most recent situation that we've had like this would probably have been the early 80s. Um, you know, high inflationary environment, high interest rates. That's 40 years. And for most of us, we didn't own homes back in the early mm -hmm. 80s, you yeah. know, and I wasn't even around in the early 80s, you know. So I think there's a lot of, um, lot of things that people expect or assume, hey, maybe this isn't going to happen to me. Interest rates will stay low forever. And that's just not the reality of it. And we talked about leverage and leverage is a double-edged sword. Uh, it can be great to acquire properties and, and acquire assets, mm -hmm. but it also, if rates start to go up, it can really crush you. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've been doing a lot lately actually is looking at, okay, well, with rates going up, how do you offset this and, and, and balance it out? And it is it interesting because we have a lot of our investor clients that are now lending on real estate because what you get a higher rate of return now by lending in real estate. So private lenders, uh, back when, when COVID was around, it was like, you can get a six to 7% yield by being a lender hmm. because mortgage, mortgage rates were below 2% with banks. Well now, um, all of a sudden you can lend out your money at, you know, 10, 11, 12% interest. And so again, if you have that liquidity, you can change money and you can say, okay, now maybe I don't want my money to be in stocks, but I can quickly change it into being, um, being lent out yeah. and I can take advantage of the current market circumstance. And that's the advantage and benefit of having liquidity in, in this type of climate, Yeah, because we've had a lot of clients that are not in that situation. And to be honest, I've, I've been a broker for 17 years in almost every climate. We've always been able to say, Hey, you know what? We can do this and this is going to help you. We can offer this. We can offer this. It's interesting. And it's important to remember that you can only solve debt problems so much with debt. <laughs> right. And so a lot of time people are coming back to the debt guy to say, Hey, how do I solve my problem that I'm having with my debt being too expensive? 
well, there's not really an not option here. Yeah. Like getting more pay debt to pay your debt isn't yeah. a solution. No. We can talk about this too, because it's interesting in the United States right now, that's exactly what's happening with, with the bond market, which impacts fixed rate mortgages across, mm -hmm. you know, across all of North America. But now there's concern that the government in the US is borrowing more money to service the debt that they already have. And they're now ratcheting up their debt even further again. It's kind of an interesting situation. So whether it's a government or a person, you can't really solve debt with debt. You have yeah. to solve debt with equity. And yeah. that means, you know, if you don't have liquidity to bring to pay down debt, then you're stuck. And what do you, what do you see happening moving into next year? And, you know, I really, I don't expect, we won't hold you to it. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what are you advising your clients on what, you know, I guess my first part is like, you know, how much how much buying and selling is happening? How many how many mortgages are you doing right now compared to a year ago? And then what's kind of your forecast of where the opportunities might be next year, where they won't be next year? What sort of give us as much of a short term kind of analysis as you can here? Yeah. Um well, first of all, it's important to know that mortgage brokers or banks are doing mortgage financing for purchases refinances and renewals. And one of the things that we've observed is that um, an established mortgage broker like myself, usually about 50% of your mortgages end up becoming refinances. Mm -hmm. um, and, and refinancing is almost gone. Nobody's refinancing their mortgage to take a way higher rate right now. It's just too expensive. It's way too expensive, right? And borrowing money to invest is not as viable as a, of a strategy when the prospects of being able to earn a high rate of return in the future is not as high as the cost of borrowing money today. Yeah. You know? So people don't do it. Exactly. So that's a big change and it's definitely affected uh, my business in particular working with so many investors. Um, so we've seen that the, the market has slowed down. The real estate market is an interesting spot because the demand has fallen because of high interest rates. But until very recently, the supply was actually even lower than it was during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so we still had this, this imbalance of supply and demand where there's still more buyers and sellers. And so we are dealing with people jumping over each other, multiple offers on homes. Um, I as remember. It, yeah. It was, it was I had to buy a house weird. in that environment. It sucked. <laughs> yeah, it does suck. Yeah. It's, it's not a lot of fun. And so it, it was weird because a lot of people on the outside would say, well, you know, who's buying today? Well, less people but there was even less homes for sale. Mm. And so until the amount of supply that's needed to match or exceed the amount of demand uh, hits the marketplace, we won't see home prices si drop significantly. Is there any reason to believe that might happen anytime soon? It, I, think it might be, I think it might be starting to happen right now. So you're asking me for my short term and unfortunately my crystal ball stopped working yeah. about a year and a half ago, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the next six months, I think might be one of the best buying opportunities for the next like five years yeah. because what I'm expecting to happen is that there will be more people that say, I can't afford it. My mortgage came up for renewal or I'm in a variable rate and I can't afford the payments or, you know, in British Columbia now, short-term rental ban. And so there's all these things coming up where people say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to put my property in the market and sell it. And I don't think that in general demand over the winter months is usually at its lowest mm. point. Nobody's going to buy a home around Christmas time and move their family around Christmas time as an example, yeah. or even in the winter yeah. in many markets, right? So I do think the next six months, you might see some price declines. And that seems like that's the general consensus is that maybe a 5% dip, but not a lot. The, the challenge then is that when you start getting into late 2024 and into 2025, the current expectations for the Bank of Canada and in general, the U.S. Fed, as, as far as where they're going with interest rates, is probably starting to go down in the second half of next year. Mm -hmm. When that starts to happen, like we saw this spring when rates went down just for a little while yep. because of the whole, you know, the the banking system down in the U.S. with a couple of banks going under, um, all of a sudden, people are flooding in to buy real estate again, like way too many people. That pent up demand has kind of a hair trigger sensitivity. Mm -hmm. If they saw a quarter of a point come down, it's sort of psychologically a green light for a lot of people. And you could see that creating again, like a spike in prices. Yeah, and even in, in January, the Bank of Canada said, we're pausing. That was enough of a trigger for right. people to say, oh, let's get, let's get in, because I've been waiting for a year. 
Mm-hmm. It's yeah. very interesting. It, it, very briefly here, do you want to outline what just happened to the short-term rentals here in BC? I, we have listeners in the States, so you guys can skip ahead 30 seconds. This won't take long, but it is yeah. an interesting bit of policy, and I have a lot of people in my group chats talking about it and asking about it. So maybe just give us a, a quick summary of what's happened here in the last few weeks. Yeah, so in BC, um, provincial government has now said no more short-term rentals unless it's your, uh, your primary residence and you're renting out either a suite or a secondary dwelling where you live. Mm. And so they're trying to eliminate um, investors that just bought a rental property that they're going to turn into a short-term rental and uh, hoping to get more income out of it. Um, It'd be very interesting to see what happens because I think a lot of people are going to get crushed with this because in the last 18 months, I can tell you that there were a number of clients of ours that were saying, I don't really want to buy an investment property, but a short-term rental may make sense. So they're buying it strictly because it does not cash flow if it's a long-term tenant, but it only would if it's a short-term rental. Mm -hmm. So again, not really thinking about that plan B and what does that look like? And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. that that plan B is not very good. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think you're going to see more properties hitting the marketplace because of that. Um, interesting to see what happens if this becomes more of a Canada wide issue, because housing in Canada is a a problem. problem. It's not just BC, right? So if BC setting the precedence, then this might go across the country. Um, at least Ontario, I could very easily see uh, adopting this as well. Yeah, I could too. It wouldn't surprise me. There's a lot of pressure mounting from sort of the, the millennials, Working class, middle class, people are getting frustrated and certainly priced out by what's happened here. And I think they're looking, policymakers are looking for anything they can that would be deflationary. And STRs kind of seem like a, a an easy domino to tip over. I don't yeah. know if it'll work. I think I, I can see both sides of this one, but it just, yeah, th- thank you for kind of, um, for laying that out for us. There, there's something else I wanted you to touch on that's unique to the business owner uh, slash investor in this conversation. A lot of people uh, dream one day of, you know, buying the shop, buying that big garage door (laughs) that goes up and it's got two levels and this ping pong table. (laughs) It's, It's like the entrepreneur's version of the white picket fence. Yeah. What are the pros and cons of buying the building that you operate out of? Yeah. I mean, the, the key is you have to kind of like living in your own home. You have to pay to live somewhere. So you might as well pay yourself is mm. one of the thoughts, right? Um, like from a commercial pay- space commercial, perspective, like yeah. if you're going to be your own renter, essentially. Exactly. You'd have yeah. to pay somewhere. You'd have to pay rent somewhere else anyways. Um, so that's a very important factor and feature. And and you start to look at it, um, it's, for, it's another forced savings account. So I don't usually recommend somebody does this and say, oh, I've been successful for one or two years in a row. Now let's go buy our space. But if you've got consistent revenue and consistent income every year, you're starting to figure out like, what do I do with this stockpile of cash? I should invest it into something. A very easy investment is just to buy your own space. You are your best tenant, right? You're going to take care of it, et cetera. Um, as a business grows as well, having the same business address for a long time is really nice. Mm. Um, and also you're you're kind of locking in your costs, assuming the interest rates, you know, are, are about the same when you renew the mortgage. If you look at what you've, if anybody that's rented for 20 years in commercial has seen almost probably like clockwork, every time they renew, oh, it's more expensive, more expensive, more expensive. This might be one of the only times that people's renewals might not be more expensive, depending what asset class you're in. If it's industrial in most areas of North America, it's probably more expensive. If it's uh, retail or uh, office space, might not actually be more expensive because because of the whole work from home movement, right? But mm. but broadly speaking, like j- across a long span of time, you're typically going to see increases as as a renter versus with this purchase route you are almost locking in your costs for the long haul, which could be mm-hmm. super advantageous 15 years out. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And maybe the renewal for the mortgage is higher or lower, bounces around a bit, but on average, it's, it's going down. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. you say be your own tenant, it, it, what actually happens there? What's the player? People Do people buy it out of their hold co and then pay the lease like from the op co to the hold co? Typically, is that, yeah. Is that usually how it's done? Yeah, and it's for... Um, the, p- the primary reason is actually just to to um, separate the asset because your operating company, if you get sued, all yeah. assets in that corp are now at risk, right. right? And so it usually makes sense to separate it. Yeah. And yeah, the reason I use that term is because usually you are technically having your operating company pay rent to the holding company. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, too, um, there are also financing options. We can get up to 100% leverage to buy your own commercial space if your company can support it. And so going back to the return on investment, if you put zero down into something, 
something, your return on, on investment is actually technically infinite, right. which is, you know, should never even say that or think about that. But the reality is that your return on investment can be even higher with a lower down payment down into it, which mm -hmm. preserves your cash for your business so that your your business can continue to grow. So there's options where we can put very minimal, minimal down payment down. Less than 5%. Yeah, even less than five. Yeah, sometimes yeah. zero. And, and you're getting that principal pay down, you're getting a long-term appreciation, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The one Very thing, the, I'll tell you what, one thing that I see happen a lot is entrepreneurs in our space are actually quite bad at predicting how much bigger their team is going to get. I, ha I have six friends who just just moved into a new space and not even 18 months later they're bursting at the seams and they need more space so they're i think that you really um it's like when you're a when you, <laughs> i don't have kids yet but i remember being a kid my parents never bought me nice stuff until i finished growing they're not <laughs> yeah. gonna get me the really nice skis because yeah. i'm gonna be out of them in two years uh, it's like the same thing with a business. If if you're still at a very um, dynamic, changing, growing phase, you really want to get to a place where things have settled and that org chart you know, looks the way it's probably going to look for five years, 10 years. Because if, if you just don't even know how that team, how that roster, how your depth chart is going uh, is, is gonna to shape up, two years from now, there's absolutely no point in sinking a whole pile of your cash in something that you may actually need to sell at some point because you're too big for it. Yeah, 100%. That yeah. was exactly, that was going to be my con for sure, is that if you're not done growing or you're not sure if you're done growing, then you can get stuck in a situation like, well, now what do I do with the space? I actually need something bigger. So well, sometimes the way to do that is, uh, depending on the business, if it's an industrial spot, sometimes the business owner will just start to gobble up the places that are right next to them. So totally. they'll buy the strata place right next to them. Whether that will be for sale when you need it or not, that's the concern. But I do think that for a couple of reasons, that point that you brought up, but also just that cash flow stability, I think that people generally buy when their their business is a bit more mature, not in the early stages. Your capital should be going back into the business and growing it. Right. And then eventually your growth starts to taper off a little bit and become more of a cash cow type of business. And that's usually where it makes more sense to start saying, what are the investments I'm going to make outside of my business? And buying your own space is a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Kyle, I get a question for you in closing here. Um, I know that you've written that one book, Rockstar Real Estate Investing. Hypothetically, if you had now written a book about real estate investing specifically for contracting entrepreneurs, let's just say, you know, on the last page or on that last paragraph, what would be your kind of parting, closing biggest piece of advice or, or few pieces of advice for entrepreneurs that are that are headed out on this real estate investment journey? Yeah, I think that the first one is just to keep it simple. You know, we talk about KISS, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> um, I think that that's something that some of these people try to make this stuff way too complicated for themselves. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, I'm going to do this really interesting investment or even going back to short-term rentals as an example. If you're running a business and you want to buy a short-term rental property, you know that that's even more of a business than just buying a cash flow property. Like you now you have to you're you're in the hotel business mm -hmm. now. I don't mm -hmm. think people understand that when they buy a short-term rental, and then all of a sudden it starts to eat away at their time, which means they're making less money in their operating business, right? So keep it simple. Do things that aren't going to require you to to re-educate yourself, to be distracted, mm -hmm. to get pulled in a million different directions. So simple strategies, hundred percent. Some something simple. Just just doing something that's easy, simple, not going to take your focus away from what your core business is, yeah. right? Um, I think the second thing is understanding the home equity line of, line of credit products, especially in Canada with the tax deductible debt versus non-tax deductible debt. It's the simplest way of, again, creating a, a, a simple um, investment strategy for yourself where I had a really good year, I had a couple of good years, and we pay down my debt. And then, uh, oh, I'm, I'm not having a great year. I have access to debt that I can that I can tap into. And that flexibility and malleability is really important, mm -hmm. especially trying to create more tax deductions for yourself. Um, and um, and then the third one I would say is the tax planning on, on, on figuring out how much you need to pay yourself and being ahead of the curve on that. Uh, not paying yourself more than you need to, but also not paying yourself less than you need to either. Yeah. Uh, if you have uh, object, you know, uh, if you're looking at trying to buy your own home in the next year or two, um, another great way to get divorced, we talked about you know this <laughs> earlier, is like, hey, we're making great money. Okay, let's go buy a home. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't pay myself enough last year, honey. We can't buy a home, yeah. right? Like 
it's really important to take care of your own stuff too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and one of the really important th ways of doing that is buying your own home. Yeah. yeah. Have some foresight and have a plan. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. been such a good little primer course on this, on just like the real estate asset class, but then the financing that goes behind it. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in, Kyle. We'll, we'll, we're going to link, um, we will link to this book, Rockstar Real Estate Investing. Is there an ebook, a digital copy our, our listeners can grab? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll make that all in the description. You guys can check it out. And uh, thank you for your time today. Of course. Awesome. Thanks a lot. And Kyle, the last quick question. If people want to connect with you and found this conversation interesting, just tell us a bit about uh, what you guys do at Green Mortgage Team and where they can find you. Yeah, um, we're one of the largest brokerages in, in the country, um, but I uh, specialize mostly in working with self-employed borrowers as well as uh, those that invest in real estate. Yeah. Uh, www.greenmortgageteam.ca or you can also call us at 604-229-5515. Amazing. Awesome. Kyle, thanks so much for uh, for joining us on, on contracting Contract Revolution. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.